Welcome back to God's Business, where I interview the top Christian influencers, entrepreneurs, and thought leaders on how you can create not just a good business, but God's business, where he is the multiplier of your success. If you have not yet, head over to Facebook and join The King's Brotherhood. If you're a man in business, you're going to want to go over there and do that. If you're listening or watching, both sides are cool. I highly recommend watching this show on YouTube. And just so that you get the rest of them, you hit subscribe. There's a little bell that gives you notification when new episodes go live, partially because, bro, I rented a studio for this thing. So if you don't give me these views, how am I going to recuperate the money from renting the studio? Totally just joking. The way I'm going to recuperate it is actually from our guest today, someone who came in literally lifestyle investor, meaning investor up top, lifestyle down below. He's wearing flip flops and shorts. You can see some thigh. Uh, but this is a guy that I've just been super impressed by. I've been studying since 2017 investors and really thought people every investment was super high risk. I then just continued to learn and from the best is what I felt. And even the things that I've brought to the table in conversations with him from the best investors, he's been able to take it that next step deeper. And that just one for me is competency, but the second one is results. There's lots of people that can talk, less people that can walk. And this guy not only has people that invest to learn how to invest with him and understand the deals and the deal flow that he goes through and getting deals on the table, but he's also someone that's massively grown in mobile home, mobile home park uh, side as well as alternative investments. And I'm excited today to jump into the biblical way to invest and grow an income where you can have fun and you literally become an investor to have fun. So welcome, Mr. Justin Donald. Well, thanks for having me. I'm excited to hang out today. Yeah, I'm excited too. I was like, I was going to fake my intro and then I, I think that was actually pretty decent. That was great. I'll maybe add some more accolades in, but I think that one thing that, again, we've had conversations before the thing that impressed me is I'll pick up, I'm pretty good at picking up things from other people, right? So I like will listen to someone who's great at speaking about investing and I'm able to like regurgitate it, think about it, and then even communicate it. And then just hearing you like pick that up and, and look at deeper things within it, I just thought that that was really, really cool. And obviously you've done a great job uh, in, inside of your investments, inside of your life. So I'm super impressed by that. Well, thanks. Yeah, it's it's fun. You know, at, at first it was daunting. And I mean, it still can be daunting. But I think, you know, over time, it, you, know, you get enough reps, it becomes a lot easier. There are things that stand out, it, it becomes a lot clearer and cleaner. Uh, there's always going to be, you know, some element for the most part of, of risk that you just have to be willing to accept and recognize that no investor is going to get them all right, you're going to have losses. But those losses can be some of the most educational opportunities that exist. Like I've learned way more on the money I've lost than on the deals where I've made money. So uh, that and and I probably wouldn't have had that perspective. Uh, I mean, I'm certain I didn't have that perspective prior to becoming an investor. Yeah, it's tough to invest with a short term mindset as well, and that's a very difficult thing. We want like cash back right away, which is why people will get into get rich quick schemes because they're looking at how quickly can I recuperate? But also like even for my life, I feel that because I didn't grow up with a family or people around me that were well diversified. And if they were, they were just very silent about it. They didn't talk to anyone about it. You were just like, they got wealthy and you looked at like the highest risk thing they did. Well, they invested in that stock. So I want to do that. Can you maybe break down for me kind of to demystify it? If someone had some extra cash or wanted to create a vision for when they have extra cash of, uh, things that you would look at today, nowadays, that would be things to start in when it comes to investing. If you were to diversify a, a small portfolio, what would you recommend? Yeah, great question. In fact, a few things I want to touch on what you just said. Number one is in our parents' generation, it was taboo to talk about money. And because of that, I think even today, it's still quasi taboo to talk about money and investing and finances and cash flow and all these things that it's like, how are you going to get better if you don't talk about it? Right? Like, why, why do we make this such a, a, a topic that, I mean, there's no reason that it needs to be kept secret. You get better because you discuss it. You get yeah. better because you're open about it. You, you know, just like all things, the more vulnerable you are, yeah. like the, the more opportunity there is to like truly engage, truly learn, truly connect. And so um, I just love teaching and I really love helping people get to the point where they feel like they can open up. I mean, even our application process for a mastermind, uh, I can't tell you how many people that basically go through it and say, oh my goodness, I've never shared this with anyone. Wow. And I'm thinking to myself, wow. I mean, first of all, great. I'm glad that you shared this because you need to. But secondly, 
no wonder you're you know not where you want to be today because you're not willing to discuss this or you've been told that you you know it's rude to discuss this yep. so you're not talking about this with a spouse family friends financial advisors wealth managers so I think it's important to be able to open up and have those conversations. So, so before you even go into the investment side, what I'm getting from that is, hey, there's one, if you don't have the conversations and get a clear path forward from maybe somebody who's smarter than you, then it's tough to build the wealth that you then can invest in. So you have no vision for the wealth. There's no place it's going to go. But second is if you have the wealth, that it randomly it comes and you don't know what to do, a lot of times people haven't had those conversations to get good advice or I love the vulnerability piece even. It's just like how often does to the lack of vulnerability hold us back inside of life? And so those two things, even before you start thinking about what's a diversified portfolio, it's, hey, how can we start talking about money? Understand, hey, I have, someone says uh, has 30,000 bucks. They may be embarrassed by that. That's right. But if they come to someone like you, you're probably like, man, good job. Like this is a great place to start. Let's keep building on this. And how can we use that? And uh, I think that that's a, a great place to start it. It's exactly right. I, I want people to feel great no matter where they are, because you can't change where you are. So you might as well go into it with, you know, good, uh, yeah. you know, it emotions, is what it is, right? <laughs> yeah. So it, it's really mind boggling. Um, just this, this whole cultural and, and I think we're getting away from it. But just the cultural norm of, uh, hey, just, you know, hide it, sweep it under the rug. Let's let's not talk about it. And I just think that there's such a disservice that happens. And then for guys, well, for a lot of people, not just guys, especially guys, though, like yeah. alpha guys, the, the ego is important. So it's, it's hard to, you know, if you're going to really, like, take your finances and, and business to the next level, you can't have it all figured out and you can't act like you have it all figured out. And so yeah. I find that there's this facade that's always up because you don't ever want to look like you don't have it figured out with your money or that you don't have money to invest or that your, you know, business is struggling right now and you need help, right? Yeah. But the healing and the help comes from when you're vulnerable, you're open, and you say, hey, let me just lay my cards out as they are. Yeah. Here's the real me. Here's what's going on. I'm in a rough spot financially. My business is struggling. Uh, I need help in these areas, and I'm just looking for someone that can you know, point me in the right direction. So let's let's hit on this thing, because I still feel this is better than even jumping into that. Here's the, here's the diversify so far, is that you probably noticed this because of your applicants, your followers maybe they finally open up or maybe even your salespeople, right? It's very interesting when you have plenty of stories on that, <laughs> yet yet it's tough because they say the average American has like not 400 or not a thousand bucks in, in their checking account. And so if you take the average, it's very difficult, but there are a lot of hardcore personalities that look like they have everything all together, but then when you actually jump into the nitty gritty of it, they may be 30, 40, 50 years old, and in a very bad spot. And that's, this is the tough part about this is that a lack of vulnerability, a lack of education, a lack of help has got them where they're at by 40. But usually I reach a lot of guys. Usually it's like, well, hey, let me just get out of this situation and then I'll get help. Right. And then I'll get educated. And, and tough part, at least from my perspective, I want to hear yours is, hey, if you're 30, 40, 50, 60 and above, and you've worked your whole life trying to get out of the situation and you're still in this situation, bar something random that just happened, working more on the situation by yourself, uneducated, lack of vulnerability, lack of help and insight and is not going to change the situation. And I, we run into this because we'll have men that seem amazing and they are amazing. Everyone has potential. This is why we are into helping people is because we see, man, you can, you can do it. This is not as difficult as you think it is. If you'll just actually just follow a process but why do you think that is, particularly with men? We're just emphasizing it, saying what, God, even in the Bible, God usually often describes wisdom as a her, right? So yeah. it's like women are just, they're very smart. And, and they're and very discerning. Yes. A gift generally seen by women and not by men. <laughs> yeah, for sure. So wh why do you think that is? Like, what's the self-sabotage? Why do people get to this terrible spot where they either gamble it away, they spend it away? They neglect their their job, their income, their business. They allow themselves to get into these pits that I'm sure that a lot of your followers that discover you, they've gone through that. 
Yeah, I think a lot of it's mindset. I mean, the self-sabotage that you talked about is a real thing. And I think when people don't feel like they deserve it or if they've heard stories growing up about, you know, maybe how bad rich people are because this one family, you know, treated them poorly or maybe had the things that they didn't have or whatever it is. I mean, often like we can self-sabotage without consciously knowing it. But the other thing is you go through these patterns of, uh, overspending, not saving or investing enough, and it becomes uh, habitual, well, it's a lot harder than in your 30s and 40s and 50s to break it, right? Because that is your norm. That is how you've done it. So it becomes incredibly challenging to shift that. And then I also think that while a lot of people are kind of like trying to keep up with the Joneses, act like they have everything going on mm -hmm. that they don't, they want to look a way that they're not really, they often fool themselves. And so maybe they're not taking it as seriously. And it's always, you know, kicking the can down the road. I'll figure it out. I'll do it later. Do you feel like that's more in the past or now? I know that for my family, my dad had a 40 foot motorhome, 28 foot enclosed trailer with all the toys in it for like off road. We had a gas tank, like a, like you could fill up a car with gas through our trailer. Like, and we'd only fill it with, with jet fuel. Whoa. So like 110 octane and all this stuff. <laughs> And, and, uh, what happened is 2008, 2009 came and we really didn't have the ability to keep that up for a long term. I noticed that then because, you know, my dad was business owner around all these rich guys and just was like, man, like, who am I? And he was like around them. So he wanted to, to adapt to that and, and be like that. And then just didn't have an ability to sustain it. Do you see that a lot now? Cause now it seems like people, it's like cool to live in a van down by the river and like travel the world and, and all that stuff. Do you feel that that's still a, a really big thing, the keeping up with the Joneses? I Yeah, I do. I still think, you know, the living in a van or, or the minimalist lifestyle is like a fringe minority percentage of the population. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I do think the majority of people, um, they, they outspend what they have. They don't save. Um, I mean, look at the stats, right? Just look at the stats of savings. Look at the stats of how much people make in a given year uh, compared to what they save. Yeah. Um, even health stats along with it. So I think there's a lack of discipline, but there's also like this, uh, this, this mindset of people not believing that they can have it, like that that's for someone else. It's not for them because yeah. of their circumstances. I grew up here. My parents were this. I heard this. And so it's almost like circumstances um, holding them back into this certain life that they're destined to lead when that's not actually the case. Yep. And you can, you know, you can shift your, I mean, we've seen it before where you can shift your surroundings, you can shift your reality by a, having a mindset that allows you to believe that it's possible and B, spending time with the people that are actually doing the things that you want to do. You, on a spectrum, you're wealthy. Like, you know, because people could say, oh, well, Jeff Bezos is really, really wealthy. But on a spectrum of averages and stuff like that, you're extremely wealthy. And that's why, you know, I'm here to learn. What's tough about it as well is that someone like you, you can now buy extra soap for your house, the nice toilet paper, the things that a Dave Ramsey or, or these types of people would tell people, don't do that. I, 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 Amanda and I did this. We were 20 and 18 when we got married. I went to a conference that made me very frugal and I did it. We didn't do it as well as them, but they were multi, multi millionaires. They bought one soap for their house, the same soap they washed the dishes with. They washed their hair and their body and shaved with. And so like, even at one point, Amanda and I were literally sh sharing a razor. She'd be like, Hey, I need to shave my legs. You know? And then I would be like, Hey, I need to shave my face. Like, or <laughs> just like, as frugal as can be, the problem is, is like, there's people that, that you see still that are just so frugal that they, they actually miss a lot of opportunity if they have some wealth, like they still won't buy the extra thing of toilet paper because they're just like, oh, like I'm free. I, they're still in that mindset of when they were poor, but then you have people that are in a place where they probably should be using, they shouldn't buy the $50 face wash and the nine step skincare routine if they can't you know, invest in their family's future, but they're looking at, they're following people that have gone past that stage. And so it's like, it can be very confusing. You're like, do I act prosperous? Like these people I look up to that deserve it. Or does the person who's prosperous have to act like they're poor to inspire other people to be like, don't use the soap. You know, like it can be very difficult. How do you like, how do you give advice to someone who's in those different seasons? Like 
I feel like there's almost complete shifts. And when does that shift happen where you can start having fun with your money and not just being completely frugal? Yeah, it's a great question. And I think most people play this game of net worth and and they need to have X amount in the bank or they need to be worth a certain amount before they give themselves permission to do whatever the thing is. And then you've got this other group of people that are like, well, I'm never going to have it, so I might as well spend it and have fun today and worry about tomorrow tomorrow. Yeah, yeah. Um, but, I mean, your, your questions are great because... There, so Dave Ramsey does a, a masterful job of teaching people how to get out of debt. The guy's incredible at it. He's brilliant at it. He's one of the best at it. And I think people that are in debt should listen to him and, and use his strategies to get out of debt. But his strategies aren't how you build wealth. Building wealth is a different skill set. Building wealth is totally different. Now, you can't be in debt, bad debt, yeah. and build wealth, generally speaking. Now, the flip side of that is there's good debt, and there's a type of debt that actually helps you build wealth. So if you fully apply to you know your, your, your skills and your philosophies to uh, Dave's strategy, then it's going to limit your upward mobility because you'll never use debt, right? Yeah. So uh, I, I think most things uh, like in life are just situational. And I can remember a time in life where being frugal, um, you know, being mindful of what I was spending served me really well and helped me get ahead. But interestingly enough, when you get to a certain point, that mindset holds you back. So the thing that got you to where you are, and by the way, we can talk about this for business too. The thing that got you to the first level of growth in your business is not the same protocol or SOPs that are going to get you to that next level. They're going to hold you back, in fact. You have to retool the system yep. and come up with you know, different strategies and different uh, you know, standard operating protocols and, and so forth. And it's the same thing you know, with your life. Like If you go through life living scarcely and and not um you know ha having a mindset that is more abundant in what you can do and and by the way this isn't just how you live but how you give as well and we could talk a ton about that like that abundant mindset makes a big difference and so when does that transition happen like when do you stop being like so frugal that you know you're uh buying the you know super cheap sh soap and sharing the razor <laughs> and all that well I, I don't like looking at it as uh, some fictitious number that when I have X amount of dollars, I actually like real numbers that make sense. My life costs me this much money yep. to live, and here's how much it is per month. Yep. And until I'm at that number, I'm going to be pretty frugal. I'm going to get to that number, and and at first it's the it's the survival income, which yep. is less than lifestyle income. Like how much is it just yeah, not cover? going out to dinner yeah. or not not the extras, not the extra right. personal trainer or any of that stuff, but That's just right. your bare. Yeah, it's like how do we cover rent or mortgage? How do we cover car payments? How do we cover utilities? How do we cover grocery bills? Mm -hmm. Right, and whatever else that that is urgent and mandatory in survival. Um, how do we get there? And how do we get that in passive income? Because once that's covered, you don't have to live as frugally. You can splurge a little bit. You can add a little bit more fun to, you know, going out to eat and and all the different things. And especially when you get to lifestyle income. So once we figured out, my wife and I, how much it cost us to live, I just pursued that. I mean, our first number, our, our survival income when I first got started was fifty thousand dollars. So I knew when we hit fifty thousand in passive income, break that down over twelve months. Right. So what is, you know, that, that per month number, I knew when I got there, it, it was like the biggest weight was taken off my shoulders Yeah, because I didn't have to work. Now I get to work. And by the way, my decisions around work changed what I was willing to do, what I wasn't willing to do, what I, I started delegating more. I started focusing on what were the things that produced the most income, you know, Pareto's principle, like how, what, what's the 20% that I do that generates 80% 80, 80 of the results. And how about I just spend all my time there and outsource or delegate all the other things that I was doing. And it actually helped me um, prioritize my business. My business was able to scale faster uh, and, and, and more organically and in a more healthy way. Um, and then once we got to our lifestyle income, and at that time in my life, it was 10,000 a month. Uh, that, that's, you know, we lived a really good life. We lived in the Midwest. Uh, 10,000 a month got us everything we wanted. I mean, that was eating out many nights a week and travel and all kinds of stuff. And, and we were, we were good with our bills. We didn't, 
we didn't overspend, but we certainly weren't uh, stingy either. Uh, and so this is, you know, a good number of years ago. So I don't know what the equivalent number is, but let's just say, you know, you have gotten to a point where 10,000 a month covers your life and you've got it in passive income. Well, now you've got a decision. You can either increase your quality of life or you can increase your investing or both. Yeah. What's interesting about it is that if I were to look at the very creative people or like hardcore salespeople, and obviously I run a sales training program. And so because of that, I get to see a lot of salespeople usually it's like, you got to stay hungry. So what you just did is you're like, oh, I ha I need 50K a year to reach just the bare minimum of covering my expenses. If we just, you know, eat at the grocery store and cook every meal and all of that. And then you have the extra lifestyle. So you had like minimum and then lifestyle, which was 10K, which is twice as much basically yep. to have fun and go out. And you guys did that. But you talked about how your decision decisions changed like when you have so much pressure on you, you're going to do whatever you can to cut expense and try to make more money yourself. But when you had that freedom, it allowed you to delegate, scale, and really think bigger. That's pretty counterintuitive to entrepreneurs because it's like, <laughs> I remember even my dad, uh, I, I'm very like, I, I have a problem with the opposite side. I have a problem. I'm just now like trying to spend money. Like I've been the guy who stuffed money in the sock drawer, you know, <laughs> hit it like, because that's what my dad always taught me to be like my uncle. Like my uncle is like a saver and he was an investor, but I didn't know anything about it. So I'm like saver. And my dad's like, oh, dude, go buy this car because then like you'll be motivated to work. You know, and like the people have this thing where if you raise your expenses with things that you are really cool, but they make you, they, they raise your expenses, then you're going to be more motivated to work. Because if you have the money, which kind of goes back to the mindset side, if they had the passive income, they would sabotage it or they just wouldn't be motivated to work. They're like, oh, I don't need to make money. What, what is that? Have you seen this? Like this is, this has got to be probably the most popular financial thing would be like, Hey, you're, you got a new job, go get a new car because it'll also motivate you to work because you got to pay for the car. What's up with that? Yeah. I mean, some people are motivated that way. Uh, I mean, I think Th you there's can no way that that's a pot. I mean, but even fighters, boxers, you see like people that are like, I need to take another fight. Because yep. I'm spending ten million dollars a year. That's right. But like, there's no way that could be like a good path. I think there are healthier ways to create accountability. Yeah. And I mean, you could do the same thing. You know, instead of buying a nice car, it's like, hey, let's let's swap out that payment with an investment goal. And once we hit this investment goal, it produces a certain amount of cash flow that we can then go take a vacation. Just a little bit more or, delayed. Yeah, or the cash flow from that deal can actually make the car payments on the vehicle, so I'm in a really good place when I buy it. So it's like a less destructive, uh, you know, way of doing it because the downside risk is is really protected. Whereas, you know, if you just go buy a car and you're like, well, I'll be motivated to make the payments even though I don't have the money. Well, what happens if you just miss a couple payments? Yeah, they can jack up your credit. They can repo your car. You know, I mean, like there's a big downside to that strategy. Uh, but I, I was always of the mindset of if I just put more money away, I'll build enough income that in time, I don't have to work this hard. So I'm going to work really hard right now because it's going to serve me so that I don't have to work this hard in the future. What was the light bulb, though? Because you, you just like me, I had, I don't know, I'm just like not, I think maybe I have potential, but I'm just not inherently that smart or didn't have a really good foot forward. I didn't really know how to build a business without mentors and a lot of help. I I didn't know how to do video really without, or like the speaking, I was able to pick it up, but I just didn't know on my own, like how to do it, how to invest. I was like, oh, I'll just save. And then, you know, I'll find, I'll find like the really niche opportunity where I navel gaze for three years. And then I find something that's good, but I missed 50 things that were solid and very good. And so for you, like, what was the, what was the light bulb for you? Because if everyone had that mindset, like, oh, I'm just going to, instead of buying that car, I'm going to put $600 a month into, into this investment until this time. How did you think that way? Was there like a, a mentor moment, a light bulb, where you just naturally gifted to be like, oh, I'm stacking cash and investing? Well, I think a lot of the way that we think is based on our surroundings. I was very intentional about who I put in my life, um, people that were playing the game of life and business and wealth building at a higher level than me. I was just always strategically trying to when did it start mix and mingle? Um, you know, probably 
I mean, probably right after I graduated college and I started my first, you know, uh, my first business. And it, do those things even go together? You graduated college and you started a business. Is that a good investment? Yeah. Well, I guess I had the backdrop that I had jobs that I could have taken. Yeah. And I felt good that I said no to everyone. Oh, so this college was your insurance then? Yeah. It's like, yeah. oh, if I can't if I can't get this business off the ground, I'll go get that job. Well, and the the thing about it is, I didn't know. If I was going to be able to start a business, I didn't know. I mean, I, I learned that I was good at sales after being miserable at it for like a year mm-hmm. and and finally figuring out how to do it. Um, I learned that I was actually pretty good at it. So it, from that standpoint, I was like, well, I could do sales, right? I learned I could. I was actually pretty good at managing people, working with people. So I was like, I could, I could do a, a sales management job. So there are things that I felt like I could do. I mean, I went to college because my parents really wanted me to go to college. Um, I want, you know, in school, I think that was like, you know, the big thing. And I'm the first person in my family to graduate college. So it was a big deal that I went. Both my parents did not graduate. They both dropped out. Um, So I think that was a motivation for me to go. But my eyes were also pretty open to the fact that, like, I I mean, I I took class. I thought I might become like a stockbroker. But I saw the life. The life was miserable. It was like, you know, crazy work weeks, like, you know, 110, 115 hour work weeks, maybe 120. And, and by the way, don't get me wrong. I did some of those as an entrepreneur, too. Yeah. But they were short lived. Yeah. Right? It wasn't like I was doing that forever. Um, and I just I mean, I could tell you one time I was running my business. I was in the office. It was like 10 p.m. on a Friday night. My friends were saying, hey, let's let's go out, meet us, you know, meet us out downtown. And I'm still at the office trying to like, you know, wrap up today and get ready for tomorrow. It's peak season. And I just remember thinking, I'm okay being here working on a Friday night right now during a busy season because I have a lot of fun outside of peak season. And peak season's like three months, two and a half, three months. Uh-huh. But there's going to be a point in my life where I don't have to work. I don't have to work this late. I certainly, when I have a family, I'm not going to work this late. When I get married, I don't want to work this late. And so that has to change. And so I just remember thinking, like, what what has to happen is either, A, I need to develop systems and processes so that my business can exist and run and function and grow without me, which, by the way, that's also hard to do, and then, and or, B, I need to buy assets that produce income. So either way, these operations can can create my cost of living in income on a regular basis. And, and, I, and I also say that um, I read a lot, and I think Robert Kiyosaki had a big impact on me as well during those early years of trying to figure out what was next. Yeah, it's wild how that information from someone that you maybe not trust, but you look up as an authority because even they had a book at the time. Now books are still like that for most people, but if you're around it long enough, you see how people can pump out a book in a day or whatever, and you're like, yep. okay, you're more selective. But I even re- read Business of the 21st Century, which got us to join a network marketing company when my wife and I were 20 and 18. And it was like, he says it's the business of the 21st century, like, let's... I don't know who paid him to write that book, but <laughs> uh, it was very interesting. One of the things I'm always interested in is, uh, I think you've been a Christian for a long time from what I remember, but there's always this moment where it's like this all in moment for people where it's like, they're not just a believer, but like a follower. When did that happen in your journey? And was it one moment or multiple moments that you were like, oh, like I'm going to actually follow Jesus, follow the Bible, not just be around it and kind of culturally be a Christian, but to, to go out there and decide to live it for yourself. Yeah. You know, I think my story is a little different than, than most, because I don't know that I ever had this like moment. It wasn't like I was living this horrible life. And then all of a sudden, you Mm -hmm. know, this, you know, I had this divine moment of clarity. Uh, I feel blessed that I was raised in a family that, um, that loved Jesus, that went to church, that, um, I got involved in in you know Sunday school as a kid and youth group uh, as you know a, a young adult, and I participated. I mean, it probably kept me out of all kinds of trouble. Like on Friday nights, we had drop in at our church. Yeah, we're about to, we're right? doing that. I think. I mean, it's today as well. <laughs> and I couldn't wait to go. And all my friends were there, and we just play sports. We play basketball. We play volleyball. Cool. We just we have a blast, right? 
Um, so, I mean, I, you know, I, I've been a Christian since like as early as I can ever remember. Wow. I, I mean, I, I, I believe in second grade was when I like formally um, professed it and was baptized uh, as well. But I've never been at a point in life where I haven't believed or where I, I mean, I, I will say that, you know, in, in the college years, I probably didn't take it, my faith, as seriously from a leading by example standpoint. Um, but I also wouldn't say that I, you know, flew off the rails either. Yeah. Um, but I, I probably was around influences that were not as good for my faith uh, for those years. But never once did I waver in my faith. And, um, and in many instances, I still feel like I was able to positively influence my peer group. Um, so, yeah, I, I mean, that's been my path. I mean, yeah. uh, it, it's just been my way of life. I've never known anything different. And, you know, I, I thank my parents for helping me ensure a strong foundation and um, just consistency of... And I ask it to get to the ne the negative side of investing. I'm, get, I'm going negative. All right. Big Let's negative. do it. See how many negatives we can go. But I think one of the negatives that doesn't take us away from investing, but it's really this like thought that it, as a Christian, that if I get my finances straight and I become wealthy, my life's going to be different. I'm going to be happier. And, and when I first read, I think it was 2016... Maybe maybe 2015 actually, uh, Tony Robbins said, "Money master the game," and I remember the one thing that stuck with me more than anything because at the time, and even I still run into this as a man. Many men think if I just make more money, my life would be better. I, I would just have 100%. less worries and all these things. And and also that you catch yourself it with it when you have something nice. You're like, oh, like if you if I had this nice car, I'd be so happy. And I'm like, dude, when things are bad. You dry, you're just as mad in the nice cars it is the bad. Now, there's like levels, right? People say that your happiness can go up with like 70, 80K. Well, let's call it 100K now with inflation. 100K a year, your happiness really changed from 20 to 100. But in Money Master the Game, the one thing that, stu that I took away from it was that Tony talked about how almost every billionaire he waited on was totally unhappy. And that was like the one thing, that's the thing that hit me the most. And I was just sitting there like, because most people would say, God tests me in that, you know, people win the lottery and they hate it and they wish they never won it. I'm like, BS, like, <laughs> like, come on, give me a shot, God. Like I'll be the one who enjoys it. But there's also got to be this wisdom that comes from that. The reason I asked about the Christian perspective is because you saw it on wall street, like stock trading. These guys are not living a very healthy lifestyle. There's also investors and you've been around a ton of them. What's been like the negative downside or that like, has it been that way where no matter how much more money someone makes, not saying they shouldn't, we're literally here telling people they should invest in their family's future, but is it going to create the happiness that they want? Or is it true that it like, you truly have to have that happiness inside of Christ and then the investments will add to that. I don't know if I'm saying it correctly, but it's kind of, it's kind of annoying because people are like, well, then why would I go and build this investment portfolio if it's not going to make me happy anyway? Yeah, I mean, I I think happiness is completely separate from all that. I mean, I think being a Christian, there it, there's this comfort, this peace of mind, like I'm saved no matter what. Um, but I also want to make sure that I'm honoring, you know, I'm, I'm living a life that is honoring to God. Totally. Um, but but in the backdrop, like I'm also not afraid to die. Yeah. And so there's this peace that comes with that. Um, but on the the happiness side, there are certainly a lot of ways to to be happy. The problem, and, and by the way, we could even dissect like the word happiness versus the word joy, joy yeah. right? And, and you know, any of these derivatives. Uh, and have you seen, are all investors, like, have you seen investors that are unhappy even though they're... Oh, fixed? most certainly. I mean, I know a ton of people that are, you know, if, if I said, hey, what, like, what's your ideal amount of wealth, like where you would be happy? I could tell you, I mean, hundreds, if not thousands of those people that I know and most of them are not happy. And I don't think your happiness, I mean, Tony Robbins also says that, uh, you know, money doesn't solve problems, but it uh, does help you solve financial problems. Yeah. Uh, I think he said someone out there, you know, many people yeah, and probably people said that, say right? like money's not the most important thing, but it's right up there with oxygen. Right. So there so, is that there is a value for sure. There is a for sure thing that 
you're, we're all going to have problems. The goal is to have better quality problems. And if you have some money, um, you can handle some of the things that uh, might be more of nagging problems or more like legit severe problems. Um, but there's so many studies that say like once you go beyond, uh, I mean, I've, I've read them anywhere from like 75,000 or 100,000 or now I've seen some stuff at 150,000 that beyond that, yeah. the happiness, you know, doesn't really change. But happiness to me is not correlated to that. And and keep in mind that if someone's happiness is, it's probably going to ebb and flow with the market. It's going to ebb and flow with their investments. Um, and, and that's a dangerous place to be too. So the the danger that I see for um, entrepreneurs, alpha, uh, you know, men and women, people, you know, a- achievement oriented is that they have the tendency, and I have done this in my life, have had the tendency of putting that on a pedestal over God, right? And and so your success is an idol, money is an idol, uh, the things that you don't have is an idol, keeping up with whoever else, you know, in, in, in your peer group that's doing great things is an idol. And so anytime those things rank uh, above God and, and your pursuit of, I think it's going to be maybe like short-term happiness, but not long-term. Is there a way to audit that? I know that because there's two types of people, right? There's people that are oblivious to that and they're like, oh, I always put God first and then they don't. And then there's people... I'd say I would fall into this category. Maybe I'm completely blind, so who knows? You just tell me. But I, I often will just be very hard on myself. Where if I even have a thought, I'm like, oh, God, like, please. Like, I'm trying my best here. Why am I thinking this way? Where uh, I just had yesterday, I had a I had a hard day. It shouldn't have been hard, but I just wasn't really, like, equipped for it. And while I was already kind of, like, negative, my grandma died last week and all this stuff, I'm like, I get hit with something. I'm like, oh, man, another problem. It became super overwhelming. And I kind of, like try to take it over myself. And then I'm like, God, what am I doing? And so even with this thought, this thought process of let's not make success an idol, money an idol and all these things. Well, often when problems pop up, how, how would we audit that? If someone was like, how do I know? I don't know if I'm in a healthy place with money, a healthy place with success or an unhealthy place. Is there a a way to do it? I mean, we're all pretty darn faulty and, and <laughs> all incredibly biased and, and probably think that we're doing a million things better than we really are. Um, you know, I think if the first thought is, what would God think? Or if the first thought is actually going to God, I yeah, think yeah. that's probably um, good as uh, an indicator that you probably are uh, living in alignment with that, mm. uh, versus like trying to take it and own it yourself. Yeah. Uh, and by the way, I'm, I'm guilty of that too. Like sometimes by default, like I just go and try and muscle things when there is an issue. Right. And then later it's like, Oh, what was I doing? Like, you know, I, I, I should be praying through this first. I, I don't need to be solving this. Yeah. Um, or I can solve it, but I should probably do it with, uh, more of God's wisdom yeah, than my own. Which you're seeing that quick though, which is also a pretty good. It's not to so the indicators that necessarily. Hey, you try to do it on your own. I did that ye- literally yesterday. I was trying to do something on my own, and literally one second before I was about to jump on a call with someone, I was like, "Oh wait!" I was like, "Oh God, uh, help me come to this meeting, hurry!" Uh, I should have said this first, and I caught, but I caught myself right, and so like, not only that it will not not to not have that happen because you're gonna have times where you react to something. And you realize, oh, wow, this is outside of my strength. This isn't what God's called me to do. I'm supposed to lean on him, but you caught it, which I think is pretty cool as well, that if people have that thought, it's not like bad, but are they catching it and going, hey, now it's time to release this over, pray even for repentance or or like, hey, God, like I know this wasn't me. Can you sh- help me shift my mindset here to, to rely more on you? Yeah, certainly. And, and by the way, um, I, it's not that I have it all figured out. It's like in some moments I win and I do that. And then in other moments I lose and I don't do that. Right. So I'm, I'm still learning those lessons and it's like, I, I celebrate when I do it right. And then, uh, when I actually realize, cause sometimes I'm just totally ignorant to the fact that I didn't do that. And it's like later I'm like, Oh my goodness, what am I doing here? Well, there's times you can do that and still won't work out the way you want. Yeah. Which is also scary, which is partially why sometimes I would think that people wouldn't do that. Well, last time I gave it over to God, I just needed to work harder because it didn't work out the way that I wanted it to. But his timeline is so far vast over ours. Oh, yeah. 
and it can be pretty annoying as humans. Like you're like, God, why won't you do things? I want it now. A hundred percent. I mean, think about thousands of years before Jesus came. So everyone's like, what is going on here? People are waiting for him to return. And then there's things that do happen really fast. And you're like, deciphering that can be really difficult. It's tough. It can. And I, I mean, I think it always will be um, in, in certain instances in our life. Not everything will be, but certain things, you know, we're, we're just going to, I mean, we're human and we're going to struggle. And there are certain things that we're just not going to figure out. We're never going to know. And yep. we're going to do our best. And we're called to repent when we mess up. And we need to be good about doing that. So there's certain things that basically everything that we do, we we can learn through trial and error, or we can learn through smart other people. I I, I feel like I made all the mistakes yesterday, but just the other day I was like, man, how many times have I heard to f- hire slow, fire fast, and just actually follow the diligent process? I'm so relationship-based that sometimes if I jump into the process, I'll be like, oh, I really like this person. I don't even want to meet another one. Like, Then I, I, I like them. I want to see more of them. And I make the wrong hire. And then I'm like having to deal with it with yeah. redoing it. And that you think you're saving time, but you're not. I'm using that as an example of Warren Buffett says that the best investment, the investment that supersedes everything is the investment in yourself, your skill sets, your growth, th- things that would equip people. Yet there's a lot of people out there that are just so afraid. Even Grant Cardone's gone to the place with, again, Grant's maybe different than Warren. Warren's very like, Sound, I would say, is low risk, very low risk compared to like a Grant in personality especially. And Grant says something like people say, Grant, if I'm investing in myself and I haven't seen financial breakthrough yet, would you recommend that I stop until I kind of use what I have, go through the courses? And Grant's like, no, keep investing until you make have breakthrough. And I can see both perspectives because I'm just like, it's so tough. What if the day never comes? There's people out there that maybe are in a a tough financial spot. They've been in it for a long time. They can't get their way out of it. They're running a business and they can't get above. And if they just got the education and did it, they would help them. But it's in a scary place where they'd maybe have to take on that debt. Would that fall into good debt specifically if they were investing in their skill sets to build the business, the knowledge base, the network, things like that? Would it fall into that category? Or is that kind of a scary investment? Because you would take on debt if it was a Let's say it was a bulletproof deal, a great deal. So someone may be advised to take on debt to do that. Would would they take on debt for education? Yeah, that's tricky. Um, I mean, I think that's going to be you know a individually specific. Why is it so hard for this though, and not college? Well, it that, it that that's exactly what I was thinking of. It's like when when I went to college, I didn't have the money. Yeah, and then you I take figured on out how to make the money. Um, well, and you you figured you're just smart in general. You're figuring out how to make the money. You literally went to learn how to invest right after college. But for the ma- mass majority of people that don't have a wealthy family, they would take on debt to go to college because it's socially accepted by everyone. Correct. But if there was a ten thousand dollar grow your mechanic business. Here's all the SOPs. Here's our email sequences. Hey, we're gonna we're gonna work you through this and help develop you into the mechanic company owner that you that's required to understand how that you're not afraid to pay your employees. We're gonna show you the path that we've been on. People would think like, oh no, no, grow the mechanic business first. And when you have ten thousand extra dollars laying around that you could literally shove down the gutter, then in, then you can invest in. But what if that day never comes? Yeah, and I think and that it, that was me. It's a certain person that you know that they're going to actually take action. So there are people that would spend that money and never do anything with it. And and in that instance, I don't think that's a good investment. If you are the type of person and you know that you're good at following through, you hold yourself accountable, or you're good at enlisting others to hold you accountable, um, then I think it's a great investment, right? So Mm -hmm. to me, it's kind of like based a little bit more on on the action and maybe more on personality type. Like do what, what's your track record and history in the past? Um, And, and I think, for a lot of people, for a lot of entrepreneurs, it would probably be a good move. I mean, I, I love, I mean, I've invested so much in myself. I mean, at this point, it's literally millions of dollars wow. in education, courses, coaches, you name it. And, um, and, and just 
even in, in surroundings, like, you know, what groups can I join to have exposure to other people that are playing the game of business and life at a higher level than me that I can start thinking more like them. Like I, I just want to be around them so I can know how I should be thinking yep. and I can emulate that mindset because where I grew up, we didn't have that. I, there weren't business owners around me for most of my life. Um, I ended up uh, uh, really befriending um, this guy, Dustin, uh, early on, and his dad owned a software company. So that was like the first businessman I ever knew. Yep. And that was like my first real instance of like, oh, wow, this is cool. I never even thought that maybe I could do it. I always just thought maybe I was going to work for someone. But he kind of has his own business and he, you know, his son helps him out a little bit. That's cool. And then I was like, well, like I, I see where his office is and like I feel like maybe I could do something like that. Maybe I could even learn from him. So it was like the just even right there, my mindset started to shift. And it's funny if you go back to my uh, yearbooks, uh, I was doing this when we were moving the last time we moved and uh, we, you know, you'd sign a little message. I don't know if you guys did this at, yeah, at your school. You yeah. sign a little message, but my big thing was like that I was going to be an entrepreneur. Or I, I called it a businessman. I don't think the word entrepreneur was, Not was big popular, then. So yeah. I said, I'm going to own my own business. I'm going to be a businessman. So you know, going way back then, that already you know impacted yeah. it, and it and my focus was on that. And just to touch on for the listeners, you just talked about association as a huge piece. People do this with sports. They're like, I want to get that Mamba mentality. I want I want to be like Kobe Bryant. So they watch him play and then they, oh yeah, I'm going to try that on. I'm going to take that mentality in. It's, it's sometimes people underplay it for business. I want to touch on this for the investment side that we just talked about. I'm pretty fired up about it because I'm just like, listen, if someone, one person was going to invest with a friend of mine and they had asked me advice on it. They said, hey, we're running at no profit, our business. They're running about $40,000 a month, zero profit. They're paying the bills, no extra money. They want to invest $25,000 into a program that was going to help them scale, become more profitable. And I just was like, man, if one thing goes wrong, 25K is only going to cover you for literally two and a half weeks. So if something goes wrong and you invested in this, all you lost was two and a half weeks of life before you were already going to go under anyway. Like I was just like, and again, that's not advice for everyone, but I was just sure. like, you're already running at so high risk, you taking a $25,000 let's get some help here is probably actually a smarter thing than just trying to keep running it at zero margin and holding onto the 25 K that literally will be burned in two and a half weeks. Now, the one thing that I will say for the people listening and let's, I want to hear your thought on this or maybe how you've done this is there another currency is time. And if you can't invest money for mentors, money for education, money for association, a lot of times you could just spend more time at it. You can go to cheaper events there's going to be a ton of people there that aren't doing big things, aren't good examples. But if you spend enough time, you'll find the ones that are. Or one thing I wish I would have done, maybe, <laughs> if I would advise myself, I would have just entrepreneurship a company that was built just like I wanted to build. Like it's insane that you can actually get paid to do a great job working for an entrepreneur and learn all of their systems, processes, team meetings, SOPs, fulfillment, marketing process, numbers. It's literally insane, which is a whole nother example of someone could come to you and be like, I, I, I can close deals. Will you allow me to come and prove myself to close deals? And can I sit on all your team meetings and all that stuff? Maybe they even tell you I have an intention to build my business one day. They could make money when people pay you tens of thousands of dollars just as an introductory get around you style. And maybe they'd even be able to show up to those events and help pass out papers. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like there's creative ways to get it done. I think at the end of the day, the thing that makes me upset is that men want so bad to lead their families, leave a legacy. And we have to tell them this on a podcast, go, go work your way in. Like they should, how do we get that resourceful mentality for the men out there they're like, I don't want to tell them that. I'm like, you should think of that. Well, I think that is often based on the surroundings, right? Like, I, I wish everyone thought that way. And for an er, you know, a period of my life, I didn't think that way because the thought never crossed my mind, right? So it was like books that did it or being around other people. So I think at some point people wake up, but most people are just on autopilot. I mean, they're, they're not 
like proactively planning life. They are just putting out fires going on from one thing to the next. I mean, it is a life by default, not a life by design. I talk a lot about that on my podcast. And um, the the more that it is default and you're just going through the motions, I mean, where on earth do you have time to proactively create and think and plan and, you know, uh, e- even ideate what an ideal life looks like or what uh, a dream situation for your business looks like? Yeah, I there's one thing that's very interesting, and I, I want to jump into this. Like this, has has the Holy Spirit inspired you to either make a good or 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 avoid a bad investment? One thing I'll touch on is there's many people that are like, they've said Bitcoin's terrible, right? And so every time they don't invest in Bitcoin, and it goes down, then they're pumped, but they never they never actually get into the game at all. So it's very easy to not be in the game and be like, oh, don't invest in real estate; it's going to go down, and then one day it, it will it will go down. And then it'll go up. For you, I, I kind of want to hear this mixture of best investment. I would love to hear your best investment you've made, worst investment, and these can be different. They they, they could be mental even, like they don't have to be just money. And then also, has there been a time where you felt God a piece go a different way on maybe a maybe even it was an investment you passed on that went to the moon, and or maybe an investment that you passed on that ended up crapping out and everyone else was like all in, but you just had this weird peace. Yeah. Yeah. I've had inner peace, um, and, and inner, uh, emotional distraught over many different things. And, um, early in my life, I used to think it was just me and my intuition. And later in life, the, uh, the more in the scriptures I was and the more awake I was, I would recognize that these are promptings of the Holy spirit. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, there are many times that there's been a good deal, but maybe I couldn't get my heart behind it because it wasn't so, like I don't. For me personally, I'm not going to invest in things that I think make the world a worse place. So I don't care how much money they make. That's just not for me. Yeah. Um. So and that's like a God's word original. Like you could just read the Bible and have a filter for that. You don't have to hear from the Holy Spirit correct. on something like that, which I think is a cool point to make for everyone. Is that. 100%. They could just read the Bible and be like, "Hey, if this goes against what God says, morality, as a as a basic example, that's a good place to start because you're already hearing from God at that point, no that's matter right. how good the investment is." Okay, that's right. Um, but I mean, sometimes God will show up in many ways, and it's that whole example of like, you know, at first it was, you know, you got this little tickle with a feather, and then you got a brick dropped on you, and then eventually you got hit by a Mack truck, and and it's like. Uh, you know, well, I couldn't get your attention with the feather or the brick, so I had to bring the Mack truck, right? Yeah. Uh, and so for me, it was almost like that with the, the biggest investment that I ever uh, lost money on, and it was a big loss. Um, I, in fact, we talked about it at uh, <laughs> Lake uh, Lake Powell around the bonfire. Yeah. Uh, and and this was a situation where not only was I so I was lured in by an attractive return, so it was like the sexy return that trumped logic, even to the point that my attorney said, these docs are horribly written, whoever their legal counsel is is not good, Uh, I highly recommend against it, plus the way they're guaranteeing this, I think this is a Ponzi scheme. My attorney literally said this to me. Wow. And I still had the audacity to think, well, I know more than him, and I know more than these other people, and it seems good, and I need this money right now, and I'm going to invest in it because I had good cash flow. And by the way, that was a good investment for, I don't know, four years. Wow. And then it wasn't, and I lost everything, and it turned out to be a Ponzi scheme, just and like my did, And said. did you put more into it over that time, or did, did you actually get a lot out? I did. Well, I put more into it, and I got some out, but some out. Yeah, yeah. You know, certainly not anywhere <laughs> close to all of it. Yep. But it's like, in, my, in the core of my being, I knew that this felt too good to be true. I knew it. I knew it. I wanted to believe it. I did my homework. I had friends that were in it that had gotten payments for five years prior to that and everything was good. And so I just emotionally let this good return and what I wanted to do trump the logic and reason. And by the way, there were several people that didn't like it. There were several people that were like, this smells funny. Yeah. And I just didn't listen. And there was a social influence of people that you trusted probably and and all of that stuff. But also... Tough part is like, what if it went well? Did you ever have a time where you thought it was too good to be true and it ended up being true? Um, 
that it was too good to be true and then it still was true. Yeah, certainly. Yeah, I've had a few of those deals as well. Um, and that, that makes it tough too, is you're like, if that would have gone well for nine years, you know, maybe you get out of year eight and you're like, oh, wow, that was great. I got, I, it, it ended up working out. So that's, that's a tough one as well. T- tell me about the ones that you thought were too good. I had a too good to be true as well and ended up being true. But that was maybe like, my poverty mindset or like yeah m- my mindset being rattled um what were the ones that were too good to be true and they were true well it's interesting early on i uh like my very first uh mobile home park that i ever invested in like this was nerve-wracking it was the most yeah. money i'd ever put into any deal ever um you know i had saved a long time to have these dollars and if this deal went well we would replace my wife's income and she could stop working wow. right as a teacher so like that's a big deal but i remember i was so nervous to part with this cash and i remember i was i would wake up in the middle of the night in cold sweats and i'm like am i just like what am i thinking and my Mm -hmm. friends thought i was crazy all my friends are like this is stupid why are you investing in mobile home parks is a horrible you know investment and i just i remember like having this total peace wash over me and this is after many like sleepless nights waking up in cold sweats like are you throwing all this money away you're just throwing in the trash and I had this piece come over me and it was it was like, Justin, other people have done it. Uh, you don't have to hold your money this tight. This will work. Just follow the plan. And I, and so literally I went from being so nervous to being totally calm and saying, you know what, this is the right move. And I think like that was, uh, even if I didn't recognize it in that moment, I do think that that was like the Holy Spirit, you know, really showing up and just giving me a calm and a peace because I wanted either the door to close yep. or the door to be wide open. And the difference between those two is one, it was bad on paper and the emotion got you in. This one was maybe a lack of education, a lack of experience. Everything feels uncomfortable. And even for the people I talked about, the that personal investment, I remember my first personal investment in our business that was around 10000 I was so depressed and so nervous and I had gone to ministry school, all of this, because I had never done that. Yeah. So just the inexperience of even, I didn't have to do anything. I just literally had to give them money. They almost didn't let me buy because they were so annoyed at how introspective I was and scared to make a bad decision. And then when I made it, it just felt like I felt light. I even remember at this point, I was so stingy, like I was telling you about. <laughs> so I went across the street from where I invested in this $10,000 thing and I bought a carrot juice for like $9. And that was like, I was like, you know, I spent 10 grand. I'm like, I'm going to have, I'm going to celebrate with like a press juice. It was like nine bucks, which would have been like a total no, no at the time. Right. Cause I was like so frugal with everything. But I noticed the difference in those two was you had a lack of experience, obviously a lack of education. Cause it wasn't, you're kind of emotional about the, even the numbers, but then it was a good deal. The other one none of the numbers, everything felt off, but then the emotional side is what got you in. That's right. This was the emotional side trying to keep you out, which is very interesting. Yeah. And at that time I hadn't had a deal go bad. So it was almost like Mm. I've got this thing figured out. Like I know more than my attorney knows. I know more than my friends know. Like I, I know the most here. And when you think that way, it really clouds your judgment. I mean, look at how many people are over leveraged right now? What, where, where are investors with? Give us the insight. Cause it's, I just heard someone the other day, they just had a business go really south and they're a pretty big influencer. And they did a video and they were like, Hey guys, like I want to come out first and be like, Hey, I know this went really south. We did a really terrible job, but everyone has been feeling it lately and business has been harder and all this stuff. And I was like, Oh wow. Like I, I never really hear anyone say anything about that. Actually. Like that's interesting for investors right now, how are they actually doing? And go through maybe a few different pockets, real estate, funds, whatever. How are investors actually doing right now? All right. The place that investors are, it's it's mind boggling how much uh, the truth is coming to light and strategies that people thought were working aren't really working or deals that papered and, and you know, penciled out and worked in a certain environment don't work today. So I know a ton of investors that are getting clobbered right now. I know a ton that are literally sitting on businesses and investments that are about to implode. 
Um, some have already started. So I've already seen like that there are a few pretty big uh, investment groups and, and specific assets that have already started to crumble here uh, towards the end of August. And so I think we're going to see more and more of it. So what happened the last 10 years is anyone who, I mean, anyone who wanted to get into investing could get in and figure out how to make money. It was just so frothy. It did not take someone that knew, you know, their stuff back and forth. And so they were rewarded for bad habits um, for, for most of the people in the space. But the problem is those deals, though they may have worked if they went full cycle over the last 10 years, the ones that haven't exited yet, that haven't been locked in with like long-term debt, for example, if you're doing a real estate deal, like those are going to be crippling for a lot of people. And interest rates now, it makes it really hard to buy property um, or, you know, even business loans to, to get dollars that at a, at a percentage that makes sense where you can profit above and beyond it. So we're going to see, I believe, a, a whirlwind of businesses that fail, real estate that fails, uh, investments that fail. I mean, it, I was checking the SEC website the other day. There are so many investments that are now Ponzi schemes uh, or are being looked into by the IRS, like way more than I've seen in the last couple decades. And, and this is because they are still continuing to raise funds, paying back investors with the funds that they're raising. That's what would get them in this situation, That's right. That's which right. again is going to be good intentions. But how do you, how do you? Well, in that situation that? generally continues going until there's no money. And yeah. once there's no money, then the investors make a big deal, and that's when the SEC finds out about it. So now that money's not as easy, a lot of these deals that were working are not working. These wow. deals are dying. And so I know several people, I mean, I know one person in specific that has four deals right now that have gone bad, four big deals that they raised money for um, that, uh, I mean, two of them I think are straight up Ponzi schemes. Um, one of them literally it just died. Like there was no money. The deal died. Everyone wow. lost money. Uh, all investors lost all their money. And then this other one was like an embezzlement. Um, so it's, yeah, it, it is a, a different world, uh, now than what existed, you know, even a year or two ago. So on both sides of that, how does... How do they not build and then just get blown away? You know, it's like all their wealth is now gone. They built it and then it's just gone. Like they could lose everything that they have maybe in those deals or maybe there's a way around it that they don't lose their personal money or something. But they lose a lot of reputation. They lo lose good friendship. A lot of people that they owe. And then on the investor side as well, both sides. How, one, how do they avoid that? Two, as an investor, what should we look for now? <laughs> like what, like what's, it's, it's freaky. You don't want to be out of the game all the time. Right. Like when do you how do you stay in the game and do it right? Yeah. I mean, in every season, there are going to be opportunities. And so sometimes the best opportunities arise in the worst uh, markets or worst economic seasons. And so I just like to be open and, and be paying attention instead of, you know, riding the emotions of investments. I like to be paying attention to what opportunities exist. Um, so I think, you know, at any given point in time, there's opportunities if you look for it. Is there any place hard. that you've been particularly without giving anyone advice like that you've like, oh, I put my, I've put my money in these areas? Yeah, I mean, I still like a lot of cash flowing real estate if you can buy it in a, a manner that, that you're getting it, you know, for let's just call it underpriced. Like commercial or residential or either. 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 Because um, I was just looking at rents in California. It's insane. I know it's not a good renter state at yeah, all or uh, not a good place yeah. to have a rental. But man, you can't get a place for 3000 bucks a month under that's over 1200 square foot in in a, a, a hour radius. Yeah, it's it's crazy. And And by the way, how do you do this right? You work with people that have a track record that have been doing it for you know, 15, more than 20 years. years. More yeah. than 10. More than 10 years. You have to have work. I mean, I mean I, 2013 was 10 years ago. Like if yeah. you were been in it for 10 years, like, again, it was impossible to buy. It was almost impossible to buy a piece of real estate that would have been that yeah. bad. I, I mean, I think you have to at least have been through the 2008 crisis investing to know 
how to handle anything. And ideally, through the dot com or you know just through one other crisis, you know that that you have had that experience. So the people I invest in, that's what I look for. The real estate uh, operators, that's what I look for. The people that um, you know are in business and and it's a, a private company like that. That's what I look for. That you have a track record. That this is not speculative. That um, we're not banking on whether this this idea works or not. We know it works because you have revenue, you have profit, uh, you've got a team, you've got a track record. It's grown X percent quarter over quarter for however long, right? Like yeah. th- those are the things that I'm looking for. Um, but it, it is possible to de-risk your deals, and it is possible to find people that you know ha- have have been doing it a while. I mean, I still think mobile home parks. Um, there's a great opportunity there. Industrial real estate has been the leader of, of the major asset classes um, for the last five years. Some people predict it will for the next five years, uh, especially in hot markets like Texas, your eighth largest economy in the U.S. Um, and there are other markets too, but uh, there's certainly markets you don't want to be in. I think there are trends right now that are, are pretty positive uh, for the growth of AI and what AI is going to do. I don't think all AI is going to work out, but the, the ones that are the front runners are going to do really, really well. Yeah. Um, I think that uh, there's still a great opportunity in, um, you know, some of the spaces that are, are less regulated or are unregulated or that there's a discrepancy between federal and state uh, on legislation. So there's ample opportunity. I still love technology. I still love e-commerce. So there's a ton of opportunity out there, but like most businesses, they're going to fail. So you've got to pick the ones that aren't. And ideally, before you get into the high risk stuff, buy things that cash flow. Therefore, there's lower risk and try to get your your expenses covered and, and then use that surplus cash flow to make risky investments if that's the type of investing that you want to do. Because even people that had maybe some residential homes, they bought them at a good interest rate that they're renting out. They're probably doing great because I've heard that rents don't necessarily usually go down. Like they just well, kinda... they are. I mean, the trend right now is that rents are going down. Rents here in Austin have gone down. Really? Um, yeah, I think there is a a national trend that rents are going down outside of a few pockets. Now, long term, I think they'll go up. Yeah. You know, but some people are so thin on their margin that they may not be able to to wait that long, right? Some people buy properties that have a negative cash flow, so they're in trouble, mm-hmm. right? A lot of people actually bought properties based on, uh, I guess, a, a thesis that they would be able to do short-term rentals, which yields a higher profit than long-term rentals, only yeah. to find out that uh, if you look at Airbnb's numbers, they're down almost 50% yeah. in their top 10 markets across the U.S., Yep. right? So so now people who want to do short-term are being forced into long-term, but they're not making enough. It's negative cash flow, yeah. Uh, and how long can you hold out if you're not making money? So a lot of people will probably have to sell these homes. Yeah, in Waco, people have been making tons off Airbnb. What's crazy is Chip and Joanna Gaines are opening up a, their own hotel. Oh wow! And so now it's like, who's going to want to who's going to want to go chill at the the rip off Chip and Joanna Gaines Airbnb for four hundred bucks a night when their hotel's probably going to be two hundred or two fifty or whatever? And you got the whole experience of their whole thing. And I was like. That can totally wreck someone. Whereas before, dude, people were buying houses for eight, 80 grand and rent and doing short term rentals, 250 bucks a night and paying off these homes in like two years, three wow. years. Yeah, that's it incredible. Just, it was crazy. At, but again, it's like the uh, what you're saying is is so right on and also gives people hope that you just got to be, you got to, I think one also building, it's okay to build slowly. I've done this maybe in the wrong way. Where I've just always told Amanda, I like, honey, if we just are growing by like 1% or if we're just profitable every month, like I'm happy. Like I've just been, that's just how I've, and I probably missed out on the biggest opportunities in the world, but I'm like, ah, oh, I'm just so glad I didn't have to like destroy my family to try to build a $300 million, $3 billion tech company or something that was so leveraged. You've seen these people, like there was that girl that went to jail, had all these donors. It's a Netflix show. She had a blood reading company. Like yeah, read your blood work or whatever. Yeah. And it's like, dude, like when you ride that wave that long and you get, and you just put yourself in that situation, I'm just like, yeah, she's done way bigger things than me. She's raised more money. She's killed it. Yeah. And I'm just like, for me, I'm just like, if I could just be profitable every month, 
live a pretty safe life, like outside of maybe some other things. I just, I like just winning every month. Like, I don't know. There's just something for me. I'm maybe I'm dumb. I think it's great that you figure out what is comfortable for you, right? Because it's, it's not what other people are doing. It's how do you live in the best space? How do you show up for your family the best? Like what, what's the business environment and the overall life environment that allows you to show up best for your family and your friends and, and your loved ones. And I think you live that. And, was Hawaii hit with a laser beam that lit it on fire? And was it so that people could recuperate the real estate? And is it some crazy like play? I have no idea. And I have not looked into it enough to to know thought you maybe had what on earth for me. Yeah, I have, I have no idea what happened. And I probably should look into it more. I mean, at this point, I just feel like there's so many people in need that the, yep. the I'm sure there are going to be people that that speculate what it is. And I'm sure that there are people that know. And, uh, you know, nine times out of 10, it's generally what you think it is, not what you, you know, uh, what, what most people don't think it is or the rare thing. But I have no clue. All I know is there are people in need and I feel so bad for that situation. Yeah. yeah. And, and I think it's our uh, mutual friend, Brandon, has been doing a ton of work out there. So shout out to his stuff. Yeah. Uh, his, his podcast in, in Mastermind is what? Better Life? Better Life Tribe. Yeah. Better Life Tribe. Um, and he's been actually there. What's crazy about him, dude, is he actually, the day the fires hit, he had a training for my community. And we didn't even know what was really going on yet. This was like the night where he got evacuated. And he did the entire training on his phone with cell service. And we didn't even know. We were just like, yeah, pray for Brandon and Hawaii. Like, we don't even know. And that was crazy, one, because he had been up all night and he still did the training. Um, But for the people listening as well, with his podcast, Better Life, They've been doing a ton of stuff. I think all the profits from his show and that 100%. company yes. get get uh, sent to charity, like Tim Tebow's foundation. I'm assuming right now they're probably focusing on a on a direct need. I have a person I know directly that her first home that her and her husband bought after they got married got complete like, like they just did videos of look at we got our sofa finally completely devastated like gone yeah the whole thing wiped um, which is just insane and it can feel. When you're so far away from it, it can feel like, oh, wow, that's over there or whatever. Right. Um, so anyone who wants to support with that, they can go check that. I'm sure that you've. Yeah. You've Brand, been Brandon with that. Turner is one of the most generous people I've ever met. Just an incredibly kind heart, a kind soul, someone that you want to be around, someone that you want to learn from. So I highly recommend checking him out, supporting there, but check out anything he does. Yeah. So if there's a Christian man or family that's listening and they're like, hey, I want to build an investment portfolio, or this is maybe a style that they really like to to really start thinking about this. I know you have your show. You guys obviously have your education and masterminds and things like that. Can you kind of point people in those directions so that they can go deeper? This is scratching the surface, yet they can go a lot deeper, one, free, uh, and then two, if they're actually serious about it, they can they can go work with you guys. Yeah, my goal is that we're always going to have a ton of content that is free. So I've got a podcast. We've got a ton of episodes. I think we just launched 150 um, this week, or maybe it launches next week. And, uh, uh, you know, we've got a blog. We've got, uh, you know, a book that is either free or uh, cheap. And, yeah. uh, and and so any of those are, are great resources. If you go to lifestyleinvestor.com, um, there's all kinds of content there, uh, master classes, online courses, the uh, mastermind. And so, uh, and, and we're actually in the process of building a tax strategy course this awesome. month at the end of this month. And then we're doing another passive income, uh, one day event, uh, which is our first live event for non-members. It's the only time we've ever done a awesome. non lifestyle investor mastermind event. Um, so we're excited about and that. And that's on the side as well. That is, yeah, that's on, I believe that's on the site. It's uh, September 29th, 2023. Uh, but another thing that uh, I'm totally open to your community doing, if, if you feel that they'd have interest or if anyone watching or listening has interest is um, you can go to lifestyleinvestor.com forward slash consultation. And you can actually talk to someone on our team to figure out, hey, are, are there steps or strategies I should be thinking about right now uh, based on you know what we know and what we offer? Nice. That's awesome. And and for the people you would want consultation, that's what he was just talking about. But two, you talked about the book that's on there. If there's actually someone that's that's listening or watching, even if it's a piece of content or you randomly make it to the end of the show and, and you're like, oh man, like I can't even get the book, literally just DM me on Instagram, Nicholas Barely, and I'll literally buy it. And I'll buy it so that he doesn't have to 
like I'll buy it at wholesale, of course. Yeah, I'm going to negotiate here, <laughs> uh, but 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 I would love to buy it for for whoever. Um, just literally DM me on Instagram. That stuff like that is such a it could go such a long way. Uh, and literally everything in my life, man, I I've been so impacted by those who invest. Even my first, I got saved at 18, and a lady literally bought my trip to my first event. It was like wow. 250 bucks for my first Christian event. It's like I can't go. And she bought it. Another one where I met my wife was a grandma. I couldn't afford to fly. And she bought my ticket and my flight to go to the event where I met my wife. Wow. And so though people would say enabling, man, I was hungry. I just didn't under I just wasn't there yet. I didn't understand resourcefulness or I need to like make this happen. I was just like, hey, if I don't have the money, I can't do it, you know? Yeah. Um, and someone believed in me. So happy to to purchase oh, that. That's awesome. I, yeah. I appreciate that. For those that don't know, the lifestyle investor. Um, ended up becoming a number one Wall Street Journal bestseller and USA Today bestseller, um, despite my thinking that no one would really want to read it or find interest in the things that I found interesting. Um, but more importantly, with that book, as of 2023, it is now a top 1% of all books sold based on volume and revenue. Wow. And in addition to it, all of the proceeds of the lifestyle investor go to fight human trafficking. Awesome. So it either so maybe I won't buy it wholesale then. <laughs> we'll just we'll just buy you, them, we'll just buy them flat out then. We can we can hook up your community yeah, yeah. no problem. Cool. So I appreciate it. Any man. way you look at it, we're we're donating. Yep. So Justin Donald on Instagram as well, lifestyle investor. I appreciate you being here, man. This is so cool. And thanks for opening up to our world in a time like right now. This interview a year ago would have been different. And right now it's for such a time as this. So thanks so much. Well, thanks for having me. I always have fun hanging with you, Nicholas. Yeah.